and welcome to What Happened, the disaster chronicling pop culture YouTube showcast. Filmed in glorious disaster vision and encoded with sonic shuffle blast processing, we cover various forgettable failures project by project. Today is a special episode, cold off the heels of the quietest WrestleMania in history that was so big it had not one but two nights. This what happened so big it needs not one but two hosts. Calling it straight down the middle, the host who boasts the most roast, my favorite Irishman, Jay Hunter of OSW Review. Yay! In your face, Irish Space Coyote! Yeah! <laughs> what happened leaves the video game verse and enters the wrestling universe. Who better than the knee bumping, bar munching, crisp crunching host of OSW Review? I'm sure I've scared away all of your fans. Sorry about that, man. I'm Jay Hunter. You may know me from those Irish lads who talk bollocks over old wrestling and references mat drops that you don't get. That's us! Break out the bin bags! Meow, 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 meow. Thank you. So, with visions of sweaty, beefy men beefy. floating around in your mind palace, let's cover the epic rise and much more epic fall of the second biggest wrestling company of all time. It's what happened WCW. So, so let's fucking do it! <gasps> Since the beginning of time, man has yearned to wrestle. Why, back when the lonely caveman first laid eyes on the wolf, bear, or even the mighty sun, he knew he would slap on a rest hold. This all culminated thousands of years later when Vince McMahon inherited his father's company, the WWWF, and took it national, establishing a dominating force in the wrestling industry, which up until that point was comprised of territories from all over the US of A. To combat this, Atlanta-based magnate Ted Turner purchased Jim Crockett's Jim Crockett's Productions in 1988 for a cool $9 million and renamed it World Championship Wrestling. World Championship Wrestling! WCW! Along with the exposure from its governing body, the NWA, Ted Turner showcased WCW on the various TV channels he already owned, and started to lure over various wrestlers and talent under this new umbrella. Why this sudden interest in wrestling, or more accurately, wrestling? Well, it's because he was, and is, a massive mark for the business, and now owned a sizable portion of it. WCW was immediately number two. Sky rockets at night! Woo! Over the next few years, WCW became a consistent but small threat to WWF's domination, led by the youthful energy of indie darling Hulk Goddamn Hogan. The Hulkster left WWF in 1993, saying, I'm going to Hollywood. <laughs> and in 1994, the stars aligned. At Universal Studios Florida, Hogan was filming his floppy failure, Thunder in Paradise, and bumped <laughs> into the styling, profiling, limo riding, jet flying, kiss stealing, wheeling, dealing, woo, son of a gun, Ric Flair, who convinced him to take a meeting with WCW, which just so happened to be taping shows at Universal around the same time. Turner had just dumped Bill, don't jump off the top rope, I will find you, Watts, in favor of new SVP Eric the Bish Bischoff. Eric's promotion was part of Turner's strategy to beat the WWF by listening to younger execs with a TV and business acumen, rather than old school bookers he had previously relied on. Bischoff, knowing he had a golden balding goose in his mitts, made Hulk Hogan an offer of a lifetime. Hulk had wanted to retire from wrestling to focus on his perpetually always floundering acting career, but with a contract promising more money than he ever made in WWF, plus creative control, he couldn't really say no. They drove a dump truck full of money up to my house. I'm not made of stone. <laughs> Thus, the Hulkster was back into wrestling, officially signing with WCW in a ticker tape parade at Disney MGM in the summer of 1994. Now, despite years of Hogan battering reams of cartoony villains such as the Dungeon of Doom over and over again, WCW hadn't made much headway. Hogan was the same old Hogan fans had gotten their fill of over the past 10 years. Eric needed to shake things up. 
Instead of cobbling together matches and interviews from pre-taped shows, they took WWF's lead with their own live show, not only on the same night as the WWF, but the same time. WCW would make no bones about it. Starting September 4th, 1995, they were going head-to-head, -head, direct competition with the WWF. It was WWF Monday Night Raw versus WCW Monday Nitro, kicking off the Monday Night Wars. I'll be waiting for you, and I'm gonna knock you out. Now, in many industries, it doesn't so much matter how well you're doing, but rather that your competition is simply doing worse. And in 1996, the WWF was doing their worst. So when one Diesel, Diesel. Kevin Nash, and Razor Ramon, Scott Hall, hey, man. were lured away from the WWF with the same lucrative, creative, control-filled contracts as Hogan, things really started to kick off for WCW and, uh, I guess, kick down for the WWF. So with these two hot acts now under his big top, old Uncle Eric decided to replicate a storyline that first appeared in the King of Sports, New Japan, which had gotten invaded by the UWFI, the Union of Wrestling Forces International. Ah, that's, that's such a money name, which was a cutting edge concept. So, Scott Hall would interrupt WCW broadcasts and cut promos, never explicitly naming himself or where he was coming from to make it seem like the WWF was indeed invading WCW. You people, What's with him? you know who I am. They did the same with Kevin Nash the following weeks and they both started disrupting Nitro every night and wrestling fans simply lost their minds. Blurring the lines between reality and entertainment, something only pro wrestling can really do, the average fan thought WWF stars were just running roughshod over the entire company, and no one had seen anything like this before in the West. Yeah, the climax of all this was the reveal of the third member of the group, now dubbed the New World Order. New World Organization, bro. <laughs> it was Hulk Hogan turning heel for the first time since... Ever. Ever. Like he'd been healed in the AWA on the territories, but nothing like this, not on this scale. This was a gigantic seismic shift in wrestling, an ultimate betrayal. Bish had done it. WCW started to gain a lot of traction and quickly started to beat WWF in the Monday night ratings week after week, month after month. Starting June 17th, 1996, for an incredible 84 weeks of wrestling domination. Jeez. WCW was number one. No company had ever competed with the WWF at this level before, never mind beating them at their own game. It took everyone by surprise, and just like that, WCW and the NWO were the hottest thing the industry had ever seen. Merch was just flying off the shelves, some of the best video games were ever released to capitalize, and in the playground you'd regularly hear that WCW was F -f 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 for life. life and just too sweet. sweet. <laughs> too sweet. Cracks start to form. A bad habit that pro wrestling tends to indulge in is producing too much of a good thing. Seemingly almost every single episode of Nitro, another member was added to the NWO, swelling their ranks. Their initial run had a whopping 28 members, culminating <laughs> in the NWO's own pay-per-view, 1997's Sold Out, which was just the weirdest thing ever. Imagine you watch a show where the bad guys just win every fight and make fun of the good guys on commentary while doing it, sucking out <laughs> right. all the tension and stakes from the proceedings. That doesn't make for the most compelling narrative. Sold Out was the first and last of its kind, and Eric Bischoff has since stated that it was a massive mistake. <laughs> but it didn't damage the company too much, so they simply rammed the NWO train through that roadblock undeterred. Meanwhile, elsewhere, well down the card, WCW, flush with cash, hired talented wrestlers with a more international flavor to round out their weekly shows and tours. Mexico, Japan, and Canada all contributed various high flyers, like Eddie Guerrero, Ultimo Dragon, and le former champion Chris Jericho. 
Oh! Unfortunately, while they would tear the house down week after week, they didn't see the same money and airtime the NWO were enjoying, despite their exciting bouts often being the highlight of the night. This led to much of the mid-card becoming frustrated with the company. While they were working the hardest, they would see the least benefit, a side effect of Eric only really being concerned with his headline acts. However, he did realize that the NWO needed to change, but not too much! Whoa, whoa, wait, what are you, crazy? The NWO splintered into NWO Wolfpack, the NWO Hollywood, the Latino World Order, and I think there was NWO Beige in there as well? Thus, the stable lost their mystique even more quickly than they should have, as with each new member and splinter group that popped up, they were simply diluting it down even more. Anyway, when booked correctly and with long-term planning, wrestlers, or even stables of wrestlers, can see success for several years or even decades, but Bischoff's goals were always very short-term. Burn through cash, hire wrestlers under any circumstances, get us to number one. WCW's big guaranteeing contracts always made sure that no one person had 100% control of anything. Sure, Bischoff was signing the checks, but if, say, Hogan or Hall really didn't want to do something, and they very often didn't want to do something, they'd just point at that fine print and ATM Eric would have to concede. Meanwhile, over at Titan Towers, WWF was inching closer and closer to full-blown Attitude Era. With no longer having main event talents to lean on, they were forced to build new ones. It would take years for it to take shape, but by late 96, the work started bearing fruit. Steve Austin had been unceremoniously fired from WCW and had vented his anger and frustration in ECW, and his trash-talking, ass-kicking persona was coming into his own in the WWF and would go on to become legitimately the biggest wrestling superstar of all time. Like hindsight is 2020, but in the wrestling business, it just proves that no matter who you are, you have the ability to be a success and get over with the fans. What is that? Roadblock. Nice. Okay, almost everyone, right, Matt? Yeah, so in the WWF, everyone was getting fresh contemporary Attitude Era personas. The Ringmaster became Stone Cold, the Roadie Jesse James and Rockabilly became the Outlaws, the Hitman unthinkably became the top heel with his heart foundation, Hunter Hearst became Triple H, joining with Shawn Michaels in China to become the infamous D-Generation X. We point this out because not only was WCW making mistakes that didn't seem like mistakes at the time, they had down the road repercussions, whereas the WWF was constantly building more and more stars without the baggage of overindulgent contracts. Now, despite these underlying problems, WCW did produce some gold during this time. Diamond Dallas Page, Crow Sting, Glacier, and on top of them all, taking the talented but kind of boring amateur wrestler Scott Steiner and transforming him into Big Papa Pump, blessing the world with verbiage and wordsmithing the likes of which had never been seen. So it's no wonder when Big Papa Pump come to town, all the hooches come around, and it's like taking candy from a baby. Goldberg, there was one more big star that hit the ring, or rather was escorted to it by a bunch of Gardee for some reason. <laughs> and that was Bill Goldberg, who, while somewhat limited in his wrestling ability, was initially booked to perfection. His music wasn't a panky porno sounding piece, or a ripoff of an actual song, smells like DDP. It was a bombastic orchestral army invasion song, heralding doom to whoever was unfortunate enough to face him that night. Goldberg was like a fire-breathing dragon, snorting and spitting smoke, a jacked-up bald guy that kicked ass and flattened opponents in two to three minutes, if not less. From September 1997 to December 1998, WCW's Starcade, Goldberg built up a kayfabe 173-0 winning streak. It was just the hottest thing in 1998. So they beat him and then had nothing for him. So he left and made Universal Soldier 4, which bombed. <laughs> Oh, 
Without the streak, he never really was the same. Another big botch was the complete mishandling of one of their absolute biggest gets, Brett the Hitman Hart, who had left WWF due to the most famous sports team of all time, the Montreal Screwjob. <laughs> Brett was a five-time heavyweight champion, but yeah, looking nice. at his brief WCW career, you probably couldn't tell. He was immediately booked to go up against the NWO before, of course, he joined them, limiting Ooh. his appeal and just making him another face among a throng of black t-shirts. T-shirts? <laughs> Uh, this was an example of WCW squandering yet another asset, not allowing them to perform at their best, even if they were the best there is, the best there was, and the, the best, best there, there ever will be. be. You rat bastards! How could you? Brett! <laughs> As we move into 1999, business was still booming, riding off the immense goodwill of these still hot acts. While people were still watching Nitro, WWF started clawing back up the ratings, bolstered by stars like Rock the Dwayne Johnson, Stone Cold and his white hot feud with Vince McMahon, Chris Jericho jumping ship to the WWF, Triple H and Mankind. Creatively, WCW's plane was in a nosedive, but instead of trying to put on an oxygen mask, they fired a shot at the WWF instead. In one of the best feel-good storylines in wrestling history, Mrs. Foley's baby boy Mick won the WWF Championship on a taped episode of Raw. Eric Bischoff, already aware of this result, instructed his broadcasters to declare live... Fans, if you're even thinking about changing the channel to our competition, do not. We understand that Mick Foley who wrestled here at one time as Cactus Jack, is gonna win their world title. Ha! <laughs> That's gonna put some butts in the seats. I'd like to dedicate this match to my two little people at home and say, Vigadio did it! It's estimated right then that 600,000 Nitro fans then switched to Raw to yeah. watch this momentous event, and while it fluctuated a bit from then on out, this is usually seen as the moment where Bischoff thought he was sticking it to the WWF, that he actually handed them the keys to winning the war. The Fed's fresh crop of stars have been established and clipped, while WCW was compounded by poorer and poorer booking decisions throughout 1999, again always revolving around the many guises of the NWO. Another massive blow was allowing four talents to leave, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, and Perry Saturn, later known in the WWF as the Radicals, and it was seen as a gigantic loss in both morale and fresh wrestling talent. And when the money losses started stacking up high enough, Eric Bischoff was sent home, blamed for this sudden and sharp downturn in business. Fans' goodwill had run out. Let's go. He wants his lawyer. I am the president! Let's go. Let's go. Things only got worse from there. <laughs> WCW then hired Vince Russo and his writing partner Ed Ferreira straight from the WWF, offering them again lucrative contracts to undo the damage Bischoff had wrought. Both writers had fancied themselves as the architects of WWF's Attitude Era. But when you look at where Russo took WCW from then on out, you could see it was very much an exaggeration. Overnight, the amount of swerves, run-ins, and over-the-top gimmick matches increased by 7,000%. <laughs> We're talking Viagra on a pole matches, yes, luchadors yes. fighting for pinatas, oh, and of course, the absolute classic, Buff Bagwell's mother on a forklift match. Bravo. Bravo. And so with that, EZ was then brought back in to undo the damage Russo had wrought. More specifically, both Bischoff and Russo would be made the co-runners of the show, with the idea being they would be able to keep each other in check, Russo's wild ideas being filtered through Bischoff's TV savvy, as Vince McMahon did with Russo and the WWF. This resulted in them rebooting Nitro April 10th, 2000, stripping all titles, fabricating another company-wide feud, which basically boiled down to doing the NWO angle all over again. <laughs> it was now the new blood, younger, underutilized talent, with some exceptions, versus the Millionaires Club, which was made up by more established older stars. 
As you might expect, this didn't really work and failed to capture the lightning in the bottle that was the original NWO run. Mostly because the young guys were heel and how are they going to get over the old established guys. <laughs> this entire shit Sunday of a few didn't last long and was topped off by the cherry that was the star of Ready to Rumble, David Arquette, winning the WCW Heavyweight title in a desperate attempt to cross promote the film. All this resulted in was a spinning newspaper which proclaimed Wrestling Company Embarrasses Self <laughs> and was a move widely hated by the greater wrestling community including Arquette himself. What? You should have known better than to trust someone from Hollywood. What's up? I loved it and to all of his detractors out there we simply say Shut up! Shut up! WWF kept on building Hell in a Cell matches, the rise of the tag division and TLC, and the signing of the likes of The Big Show, The Radicals, Kurt Angle, and of course... <laughs> With the fall of WCW, you would have expected things to revert back to the early 90s. WWF at the top and WCW as a distant second, but this is where a big old twist of fate occurred. The Time Warner AOL deal. Ted Turner's company was to merge with AOL, a disastrous business decision that while initially seen as one of the biggest of all time, wound up costing billions in lost revenue. One of the caveats of this deal was Ted Turner losing a lot of the power he once had. For years, executives at Warner viewed wrestling as an embarrassment and wanted it off TV, but Big Ted always vetoed it because, well, he just loved his wrestling. And without billionaire Ted to protect it, and with WCW losing $65 million in 2000 alone, it was getting axed. Knowing the end was near, Bischoff was frantically trying to find a new buyer for the product, with the intention for WCW to go dark for a few months while they retool. The problem was, AOL was happy to unload it onto somebody else, but not to give it a TV slot. Lacking a network to broadcast it, it made Nitro almost worthless, just a tape collection, and Eric Bischoff's potential buyer pulled out. I have a V1 sex noise with <laughs> yeah, I can indulge you, hold on. Squeezy noise. <laughs> there you go, continue. All of this went down in early 2001, while the WWF were gearing up for their biggest pay-per-view of all time, WrestleMania X7. They then saw this opportunity to scoop in and purchase their competition, giving WrestleMania one extra angle on top of many. Vince McMahon was able to buy the WCW name and trademark several contracts and their extensive video library for the paltry sum of $4 million, a pittance in the grand scheme of things. Chris Jericho remarked when he found out exactly what McMahon had paid, said, I wish I would have known because I would have tried to buy it. For the money that he bought it for, I could have afforded it. Oh, yeah, imagine if he did buy it. Even though network exec Jamie Kellner was the one ultimately killing WCW, of course, there was way more unmentioned bollocks. The Finger Poke of Doom, Warrior and Hogan at Halloween Havoc, oh. Jay Leno, Basketball Guys, Kiss Team and Master P, <laughs> Headbucker Kevin Nash, the video feed cutting off right before the main event of Starcade, and do -do 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 David Flair! <laughs> Everyone helped in their own small way to destroy WCW. Worth pointing out that WWF didn't have a much better track record. They also tried to repackage WCW, failed at that, then tried to replicate the NWO storyline with an ECW WCW invasion, failed at that, and then failed with another completely separate NWO angle after that. Phew! At the very least, since they bought the entire video library, the glory days of Southern Atlanta based wrestling at least still lives on within the network Digiverse. We were WCW. We lived, we breathed, we sweat, we paid the price to be the best. In summation, this underdog company took on the biggest giant in the wrestling world and beat them for almost two years, kicking off the most competitive and creative time within the industry, the most fondly remembered time in wrestling history. 
However, this is also one of those cases of something hot burning oh so bright but oh so brief, and rather than cultivate it, many were instead blinded by that sudden flame and all the success it promised, until it just burned itself out, proving that WCW and the NWO weren't exactly for life. <laughs> All right, I think that was a pretty solid promo. Thanks to Jay for tagging with me on today's episode. I'm that, you fucking beast, you. Thanks so much for having me on the show. It was a wonderful tale for all mankind. Also, now would be your designated time to hot dog and grandstand. Oh, yeah. Catch some primo WCW bollocks with our Dungeon of Doom Spectacular. <laughs> Halloween Havoc 95 on our channel, OSW Review. Link in the description. There's a can of Coke in it for you. And with that, if you know of any other games, movies, or uh, wrestling promotions you'd like to see on the show, let me know in the comments below or clothesline your way into the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate the subject you'd like to see on a future episode. Thanks for watching, and remember, a winner is you. <laughs>